Okay, yes, we're good. And I just started recording, so handing over to Tim again. Tim. Okay, oops, Tim, okay. let's get rid of that. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks, Claudia, for your help. And I, I'll just introduce Dean. So Dean Kotlowski is Professor of History at Salisbury University in Maryland in the US. And he's in Australia as a Fulbright um, visiting fellow at ANU and has been traveling around and doing research over here. Uh, Dean's written um, on civil rights in the US extensively um, and on political history as well. Um, he, he's got a, a book, uh, you know, it's a prominent study of civil rights in the Nixon administration called Nixon's Civil Rights uh, Politics, Principle and Policy that was published by Harvard University Press in 2001. Uh, another of his books is um, a biography of uh, Paul McNutt, who was uh, governor of Indiana um, and an important figure in the sort of New Deal period. Um, that book, Paul McNutt and the Age of FDR, that was published by Indiana University Press in 2015. Um, and today, Dean's going to talk to us further um, about civil rights, um, particularly uh, this figure of Jackie Robinson, um, the first African American, of course, um, major league baseball player, very important figure, and and um, his story and his involvement in in uh, different political campaigns to do with civil rights. So, thank you for coming, Dean. Uh, I'll thanks, hand Tim. over. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Claudia. Um, I, I, I'm shedding my jacket here. I'm going to be a little bit more informal, and. Um, want to thank you both for helping to organize this. I understand completely uh, with, with technology. Um, uh, and uh, it's really, I wanted to say, it's really a treat to be here at La Trobe. And I was talking to a mutual friend of ours, Doug Craig, and I told him I was oh, yeah. coming here. Yeah. And I want to give Doug credit. He told me something I already knew, but he expressed it better than I did. He said that La Trobe University has a royal name in the history of Australian American studies. And I said, yes, John Salmon. Mm -hmm. And yeah. being a recent person, I forgot about Reese Isaacs, but um, yeah. you know, um, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. And I will just give you a little bit of, of background. So what this is, this is a little bit of a return to some of the work I did on Richard Nixon. And it, this is gonna be a chapter that's gonna be published actually in November in an edited collection about sports in the US presidency. And full disclosure, I, I gave this um, I gave this this uh, lecture at the University of Tasmania. So I've never given this as a conference paper. I, 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 gave, I gave it down at U, U of Tasmania. And um, I think I, that's a good thing because they had some comments about a slide that they found particularly striking that uh, I think we can all uh, talk about. But it's good that we started a little late because this actually this talk can actually be a little shorter than the normal 45 minutes. So Jackie Robinson once declared, I'm a pressure group for civil rights. And he was much more than that. As a member of the Brooklyn Dodgers, Jack Roosevelt, Jackie Robinson, broke baseball's color barrier in 1947. And over a decade later, as a columnist, corporate executive and sports icon, he broke into politics when he campaigned again for Richard Nixon as Nixon took on Democrat John F. Kennedy in the 1960 election. Robinson promoted both the fortunes of the Republicans or the grand old party, the GOP, and social justice for African-Americans. Partially named for one Republican president, Theodore Roosevelt, he remained devoted to the egalitarian ideals of the GOP's first president, Abraham Lincoln. He was wary of Democrats such as Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson, whom he deemed political shapeshifters on civil rights. But racial liberalism and GOP politics were hardly a matched set. As Robinson later acknowledged, it's a direct quote from him, I am black and American before I am Republican. His relations with Nixon cooled after 1960 and especially starting in 1964 when Robinson opposed the candidacy of conservative Republican Senator Ferry M. Goldwater of Arizona in favor of Goldwater's liberal foe, um, Governor Nelson A. Rockefeller of New York. Four years later in 1968, the decline of the GOP's Rockefeller wing eased Robinson's endorsement of Hubert H. Humphrey, a Democrat and a champion of racial equality, who of course was the nominee of the Democratic Party for president that year. <clears throat> 
Nevertheless, Robinson insisted that his identification as a Republican, as a Republican gave African-Americans a presence in both political parties. And he once commented that um, baseball's integration would be meaningless if America's political parties remained segregated. Steeled by his idealism, pragmatism, and celebrity, Robinson eagerly interacted with presidents and those who he envisioned as presidents. His accomplishments on and off the baseball diamond afforded him a platform unique among civil rights leaders. Good looks, courage, and outspoken personality enhanced his authority. The baseball writer Roger Kahn once observed, Robinson did not merely play at center stage, he was center stage. Robinson's political influence ebbed and flowed, yet it set an important precedent for African-American athletes. I think there are some connotations here for Australia and the AFL as well. Modest political involvement during his playing career grew following his retirement in 1956, cresting in a full-throated endorsement of Nixon in 1960. After this, Robinson's clout leveled off. As racial tensions heightened, Robinson became removed from an increasingly conservative GOP. And from younger African-Americans, some of whom chided his politics and his associations as those of a quote unquote Uncle Tom. Yet Robinson's detractors failed to foresee later electoral endorsements and civil rights protests by African-American athletes, an amalgam of politics and advocacy that the baseball legend embodied and to some extent inspired. So I wanna do this talk in two parts. We'll just look at Robinson's early involvement in politics up to 1959. And then we will begin by talking about the 1960 election. So look at this early phase, Robinson's character, success, celebrity, politics, and influence intersected with each other and evolved over time. His athletic prowess led to historic breakthroughs, fame, and the ability to command attention, spouse causes, and endorse candidates. His life story attributes and experiences with racism forged a leader who was liberal on civil rights, but moderate or even a little conservative on other issues. Although he led no organized group and never sought office himself, he understood the value of playing the field, of maintaining ties to both political parties while making some very, very strategic endorsements. In 1960, Richard Nixon praised Robinson for handling political matters, quote, with the same agility you always show on the baseball diamond, end quote. Robinson's rise from rural poverty to sports icon molded his outlook and his later activism. Born in Cairo, Georgia to a sharecropper who later de deserted his wife and children, Robinson was raised in Pasadena, California, where his family had migrated in 1920. Although Pasadena was segregated by race, Robinson became a standout athlete at school and at college. He went to the University uh, of California at South, uh, um, Los Angeles, better known as UCLA. He never graduated from UCLA, but he excelled and he won letters in four sports, basketball, track, football, and of course, baseball. A shy demeanor, a will to succeed, and the example of his mother, a devout Methodist, kept his focus on sports. Following a stint in the US Army during World War II, Robinson honed his baseball skills, playing for the Kansas City Monarchs of the Negro American League before marrying his wife, Rachel, in 1946. His athleticism, poise, and faultless personal life impressed Dodgers president, Branch Rickey, who brought him into the Brooklyn organization. The road ahead proved challenging for the first black man to play in the major leagues since the 1890s. But Ricky believed that Robinson could handle the abuse with, as he put it, the guts enough not to fight back. Now Robinson fought racism sometimes directly at other times less so. Um, the racially diverse athletic contests of his youth convinced him that racial segregation in sports or in any other aspect of American life had no justification. Robinson developed a quick temper in the face of injustice, which tested his self-discipline. I think this is really interesting and I didn't know this part of his, his background. While training in Kansas for the military during the Second World War, he defended the boxing champion, Joe Lewis, who noted that Robinson, quote, wouldn't take shit from anyone, end quote. Robinson was later court-martialed for insubordination, though eventually exonerated when he refused to obey a state law 
requiring racial segregation on buses in Texas. While playing for the minor league Montreal Royals in 1946, and then for the Dodgers for about a decade afterwards, Robinson faced numerous indignities and even, as you can see here, death threats. His success led to breakthroughs elsewhere. Other black players followed him into the major leagues and they helped to lift Brooklyn to its only World Series championship in 1955. In 1949, Robinson was named the National League's most valuable player and he appeared in six All-Star games before retiring in 1956. In 1962, he earned induction into baseball's Hall of Fame. And what you have here on the slide, uh, uh, Channel 13, the PBS station, it's kind of like the SMS station um, in the United States, in, in here in Australia. Um, we are doing a special on Jackie Robinson. I think there was a full length documentary that Ken Burns or someone did. And they created these kind of faux or imitation baseball cards with some of Robinson's major um, accomplishments. And you see uh, some of them there. Um, became a pop cultural icon. Count Basie recorded a song exalting his ability to steal home plate. Robinson hosted his own television and radio shows in New York and even starred in his own film, a kind of B Hollywood film called The Jackie Robinson Story, uh, released in 1950. At a time when a number of black entertainers were coming to the forefront of American popular culture, musicians such as Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, uh, Chuck Berry, actors like Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier, Robinson stood out. And the historian Thomas W. Zeiler has asserted that, quote, as the most visible African-American in the United States, he also became a spokesman for civil rights. Robinson's civil rights advocacy and involvement in politics began during his baseball career. He learned, he later wrote, that a black man, this is, these are his words, even after he has proven himself on and off the playing field, will still be denied his rights. His ties to the National Association for the Advancement of Color People, people however, remain modest during his playing career. And his religiosity and anti-communism placed him squarely within the main currents of post-war politics. Robinson was impressed by President Harry S. Truman's efforts on behalf of civil rights. And in 1959, uh, Robinson signaled his regard for Truman by inviting him to appear on a radio program, a courtesy that you can see from this very brief note, the former president declined. Robinson's early thoughts about presidents revealed an uncertainty about whom to trust. His brief employment at the National Youth Administration, again, I think of John Salmon here, right, in his work uh, with Aubrey Williams, um, established a tie to Franklin D. Roosevelt that apparently withstood Robinson's experiences with racism in FDR's army in World War II. The failure of Roosevelt or Truman to secure civil rights legislation did not in Robinson's mind diminish FDR's New Deal work relief programs or Truman's executive order um, desegregating the armed services in 1948. Robinson asserted in 1959 in a letter, quote, there can be little doubt that the Negro and other minorities have benefited more under the Democrats. But I wonder whether the candidates in the running for 1960 would wave the same stick that Roosevelt and Truman waved, end quote. Two interrelated dynamics troubled him. The first was the power of white Southerners within the Democratic Party. And the second was the willingness of some liberals to placate those white Southerners. The party's adoption of a weak civil rights plank in its 1956 platform disappointed Robinson. And at the same time, historical, cultural, and personal circumstances left Robinson favorably disposed to the liberal wing of the Republican Party. Between the end of the Civil War and FDR's New Deal, most African Americans able to vote remained loyal to the party of Lincoln. Although FDR's policies drew many Blacks into the Democratic fold, some of that old loyalty to the Republican Party lingered on. And I think Robinson is an interesting voice here for that kind of tradition and that kind of perspective. And you could say those kinds of people, maybe older African-Americans. Um, after Robinson joined 
chock full of nuts coffee corporation as a vice president of personnel in 1957 so he was actually this is after he retired from baseball he actually was one of the highest ranking african-american corporate executives in the united states so after he joined chock full of nuts he kept on his desk a wooden replica of lincoln's hand holding the emancipation proclamation and that was a gift from richard and pat nixon robinson later quoted lincoln's warning against a house divided when he implored politicians to avoid mouthing racial buzzwords that only inflamed um, animus between blacks and whites. But in the 1950s, Robinson amplified his anti-racism more than his party preferences. Yet displeasure with the democratic platform in 1956, coupled with some promising moves by President Eisenhower, early in Eisenhower's first term, led Robinson to vote for the Eisenhower-Nixon ticket in 1956. Well, he, I, don't, I don't think he really publicized that, but that's where his preferences lay at that point. Robinson's participation in the civil rights struggle deepened during the second term of Eisenhower, who increasingly frustrated him. While working at Chock Full of Nuts, Robinson raised funds for the NAACP and for the African-American Students Foundation, which helped young people from Africa attend universities. And that was a cause that was also pushed by Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier. They were both involved with that. In 1958, Robinson appeared with Martin Luther King Jr. and A. Philip Randolph at a Harlem rally in favor of integrated schools. More importantly, Robinson shared his views with a president, meaning Eisenhower, who both courted white Southerners and employed what one historian called symbolic gestures to express his opposition to racial discrimination. Although he congratulated Eisenhower on sending troops to enforce court-ordered school desegregation in Little Rock, Arkansas, Robinson objected to the president's earlier remarks advising patients during the crisis. That's something that really annoyed Robinson when prominent white people, especially politicians, you know, urged patients. Robinson raised the stakes in 1960 when he told the National Urban League that Eisenhower, quote, hasn't said a thing as far as I'm concerned on civil rights, end quote. And in the same speech, he, replay, he repeated a Democratic Party refrain, a very common refrain and trope by describing the general turned president as a figurehead in Washington. Robinson's remarks signified key aspects of his emerging activism Fundraising for the NAACP had sharpened his public speaking. He said, if I had to choose between baseball's Hall of Fame and first class citizenship, I would say first class citizenship for all my people. And he said that to the NAACP. In 1959, Robinson acquired a new platform when he joined the New York Post. Post's editor, and the Post was a liberal democratic paper. It's very liberal, very democratic back then. It is not in any way, shape, or form that today. But back then, the paper's editor, James A. Weschler, deemed Robinson a somewhat unconventional voice who reflected a lot of non-organizational Negro feeling. The former ball player's thrice weekly column spanned sports, politics, and race. Eisenhower's civil rights record quickly became a target as Robinson urged him to fortify his quote unquote, singing words with definite positive action. Robinson approached politics pragmatically. Knowing that campaign promises often went unfulfilled, he looked for candidates who gave honest and sincere answers and seemed willing to lead on matters of race. And the 1960 election really marked the high point of, John, of Robinson's political influence and something of a follow-off followed. So I'll talk about that election in the 1960s. On the eve of his enshrinement in Baseball's Hall of Fame, venerated by African-Americans situated at the New York Post and somewhat present on the airwaves, Robinson won the attention of presidential hopefuls. Nixon's aide, Fred Lowry, urged his boss to reach out to Robinson since the baseball star, quote, is more or less considered a sort of God, end quote, among blacks. Meanwhile, former Democratic governor of Connecticut, Chester Bowles, arranged a meeting between Robinson and John F. Kennedy. 
True to form, Robinson gave the Democrats a hearing in 1960. The sit-ins of that year focused the public's attention on racial inequality and drew praise from Senator Hubert H. Humphrey of Minnesota, who had entered the national political stage in 1948 by pushing Democrats to support civil rights. A candidate for the party's nomination in 1960, um, Humphrey earned the endorsement of Robinson, but it failed to lift the Minnesotan to the Democratic nomination over John F. Kennedy. Now, JFK really did not impress Robinson. Kennedy's vote to weaken enforcement provisions of the Civil Rights Act of 1957 concerned Robinson, as did an endorsement of Kennedy by John M. Patterson who was Alabama's segregationist governor. Of course, he was the segregationist governor before George Wallace. A meeting between the two men yielded nothing. Robinson found JFK evasive, uncertain, and flustered by Robinson's demand for proof about, quote, what you will do for my people, end quote. He complained that Kennedy didn't look him in the eye. Robinson thus saw no reason to retract his earlier assertion that if the Democrats failed to nominate Humphrey, he would consider voting for Nixon. A cluster of circumstances drew Robinson and Nixon together. A passion for sports enabled Nixon to connect with voters and athletes, including Robinson. During their first meeting at the Republican National Convention in 1952, Nixon congratulated the star on a recent home run and then reminisced about Robinson's gridiron exploits at college and at UCLA. And he reminisced about a play that Robinson did playing football um, uh, against uh, Oregon. And then they apparently met a second time. And this is the photograph that had the folks at the University of Tasmania really talking and wanting me to say more about. Um, I think I pulled this off the web and it shows Robinson and Nixon meeting later in 1952 during the World Series. And um, there are all sorts of implications here. And at minimum, you see a kind of intimacy to, between the two men that I think is important and significant. And uh, uh, you know, we can, they had interesting things to say and a lot of questions. And I'll leave that discussion maybe to the Q and A. But no other president or politician with whom Robinson dealt exuded such interest in sports, especially baseball. And the two men developed a rapport. Nixon's early civil rights record earned Robinson's respect. As vice president, Nixon chaired a committee to stop discrimination in companies holding government contracts. And he pushed for the strongest possible civil rights bill in 1957. Nixon endorsed the Supreme Court's decision in Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 and he denounced efforts to thwart the desegregation of Little Rock Central High School. Political expediency often motivated Nixon's words and deeds. And, and I found that that committee on government contracts that he headed, there weren't many breakthroughs there. Nevertheless, Nixon engaged directly with Martin Luther King Jr., who hailed the vice president's, quote, intense interest in solving the civil rights problem, end quote. Letters also passed between Nixon and Robinson. Following a private luncheon in 1960, Robinson told the readers of his column that Nixon, quote, seems very much aware of the need for using the influence and prestige of the presidency to advance equal rights, end quote. Now, Dorothy Schiff, the Post publisher, had her own perspective on Richard Nixon, and she did not really like, to say the least, um, Robinson's pro-Nixon leanings, and she was rather dismissive of them. Uh, she observed, quote, Robinson hates Nixon. Robin, Robinson hates Kennedy and loves Nixon because he trusts him. End quote. Nixon's choice of the liberal Henry Cabot Lodge for vice president further heartened Robinson, who dismissed Kennedy's selection of Lyndon Johnson as yet another sob to the South. Remember, in that period, LBJ's record on civil rights wasn't particularly good. Robinson's support of Nixon sparked criticism, and his standing at the New York Post slipped as the paper's Democratic readership protested his pro-Nixon musings. You know, when LeBron James was making advocacy for Hillary Clinton and other issues, there was a, 
an awful phrase that that came out that you know he should just shut up and dribble, you know, and then just play the sport. And there was a little bit of this in some of the letters I found in Schiff's papers. Um, one man vented that Robinson could should quote control his personal feelings unquote, and another griped that Robinson's knowledge is politics is is sports and not politics. Although Robinson claimed that the newspaper allowed him to write whatever he liked, publisher Dorothy Schiff worried that he had become what she called a propagandist for the Nixon machine. She warned him that most people didn't trust Nixon. Not sure Republicans would have agreed with that, but at any rate, and that any politician was capable of projecting earnestness, a point that Robinson, I think, very shrewdly agreed with. In the end, though, Robinson bowed to some of the pressure from the post, and he took a leave of absence from the paper to campaign for Nixon. Robinson's campaigning for Nixon involved much work and in the end, large disappointments. He defended the Republican candidate, dismissed John F. Kennedy as callow, and depicted Lyndon Johnson as the Southern accented voice of civil rights in a potential Kennedy White House. At a rally in New Jersey, Robinson appeared alongside Nixon. At other times he campaigned uh, with New York Governor Rockefeller, whose substance and backbone, as Robinson termed it, surprised Robinson, especially after the governor praised the sit-ins and started quoting Martin Luther King Jr. Robinson and Rockefeller appealed to liberals and minority voters, which freed Nixon to court white moderates in the suburbs and in the South, a strategy he, of course, pursued more intensively in 1968. Yet in 1960, Nixon did not appear in Harlem, and that frustrated Robinson. Robinson later said that white politicians need to figure out a way to connect with African Americans by visiting predominantly black localities. <clears throat> Even more disquieting to Robinson was Nixon's unsympathetic reaction to King's arrest following a sit-in in Atlanta. Robinson, Rockefeller, and other advisors prodded Nixon to telephone King but Nixon rejected such outreach as a grandstand play. In contrast, JFK called Dr. King's wife, Coretta Scott King, to express his concern, and Robert Kennedy contacted the judge in Georgia to secure King's release. Such gestures enabled JFK to rally African-American voters, and he got about 68% of the African-American vote. The Republicans' candidates said, silence said in Robinson, who privately, albeit presently, fumed, quote, Nixon doesn't deserve to win, end quote. In the end, JFK took the larger share of the black vote, as I said, and he held enough Southern states to capture the White House. To make matters worse, the day Nixon lost the election, Robinson lost his job at the Post. Robinson's decision to campaign for the vice president had frayed relations between him and the paper, and there were some other issues as well. Undaunted, Robinson spoke a month later in Montgomery, Alabama, where he continued to support Nixon. He openly attacked what he called Black's quote unquote mistaken support for then president-elect Kennedy. So it's almost like he, he didn't want to concede the election in, in, on a certain level. Defiance really did define Robinson's politics following the 1960 election. The endorsement of Nixon had offended a number of African-Americans. The letter, the, me, the editor of the Baltimore Afro-American called the former Dodger tragically out of step with the nearly 70% of Blacks who had voted for Kennedy. And a columnist for New York's Amsterdam News, another Black-owned newspaper, chastised what they called, quote unquote, self-styled Negro leaders who had been, quote, advising Negroes on how to vote, end quote. The jibe did not prevent Robinson from joining the New York Amsterdam News as a columnist. So he had a new platform and he used it and he derided Kennedy's reluctance to sign a much promised executive order outlawing racial discrimination in federally funded housing. To be sure, hints of detente began to surface. Robinson really appreciated Attorney General Robert Kennedy and Robert Kennedy's interest in African-American issues and African-American voting rights. And Robinson applauded JFK's forceful espousal of civil rights following mass protests in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. That same year when Americans mourned the slain Kennedy, Robinson, I think very generously declared that Kennedy had quote, done more for the civil rights cause than any other president, end quote. 
Such kind words aside, he remained loyal to the GOP during the early part of the decade. Two days before JFK's inauguration, Robinson told Nixon that, quote, our country is the loser, not you, end quote. And when the former vice president sought the California governorship in 1952, Robinson appeared on a celebrities for Nixon list. After Nixon lost that race, Robinson consoled him saying, quote, you are good for politics, good for America, end quote. He used his, um, um, his name Dick there. Uh, so you see the familiarity um, in that letter. The election of 1964 marked a crossroads for the GOP as it moved rightward and for Robinson, who proved a staunch liberal Rockefeller Republican. Rockefeller's presidential ambitions crashed against the grassroots movement determined to nominate Senator Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater. Conservatives shared the, the, the Senator's distaste for federal power, a disposition that had led Goldwater to vote against the 1964 Civil Rights Act, delighting white Southerners and disgusting Robinson. In contrast, Robin, Rockefeller backed civil rights and governed liberally in his home state of New York. Robinson went all out for Rockefeller, whom he called a force for human dignity and world peace. He stumped for him in the primaries and labeled Goldwater a bigot who, quote, inspires the lunatic fringe that is out murdering Negroes in the South, end quote. Later, Robinson cheered Rockefeller as Rockefeller struggled to address the party's convention over the catcalls of triumphant Goldwater delegates. In 1964, Robinson privately vowed to fight like hell to inflict a stunning defeat on Goldwater. And he set aside his distrust of LBJ to chair the National Republicans for Johnson Committee. Metamorphizing from conservative Texan to liberal president, Johnson secured the passage of landmark civil rights legislation, which greatly pleased Jackie Robinson. Quote, no American in public office has grown as you have. No president could have affected the progress in our drive for human dignity as you have done, Robinson wrote Johnson. Robinson's anti-communism prevented him from becoming a critic of Vietnam of the Vietnam War. Indeed, he praised Johnson's efforts to seek an honorable end to that conflict. Not unlike Eisenhower and Kennedy, LBJ understood J Robinson's unique contribution to race relations, and he hosted him and his wife Rachel at the White House. And you know, they didn't say this in public, but in an oral history at the LBJ Library, one of Johnson's aides who dealt with civil rights, Lee White. Um, noted that LBJ had appointed the first black cabinet member, Robert Weaver, the first African-American Supreme Court Justice, Thurgood Marshall. And in this oral history, he compared these men and their breakthroughs to Jackie Robinson in baseball. But Robinson's ruminations, including a complaint about widening racial division in the 1960s, annoyed the White House as did his continuing ties to the GOP. One Johnson advisor, Clifford Alexander, himself was African-American, observed, quote, while it is true Jackie Robinson supported the president in 1964 with his right hand, he was doing everything with his left hand to, in, to defeat a variety of Democratic senatorial and congressional candidates, end quote. So Robinson lived in New York in 1964, and he endorsed, of course, and campaigned for Johnson. He voted for him. But in the Senate race that year, he voted for the incumbent moderate Republican Senator from New York, Kenneth Keating against Robert Kennedy, who was the Democratic nominee. Nevertheless, Robinson continued to enjoy a close relationship with Hubert Humphrey, who was by this point Johnson's vice president and whom he endorsed over Nixon in 1968. Robinson's civil rights advocacy expanded during the 1960s Along with other celebrities, he participated in the March on Washington. He remained committed to, the, to integration and nonviolence, but he also supported Black-run institutions and economic empowerment for African-Americans. He co-founded and served as the chairman of the board of the Black-owned Harlem-based Freedom Bank, Freedom National Bank. And he later formed a construction company that managed to build about 1,600 housing units for low-income people. Within the civil rights movement, Robinson was unapologetically independent. He attacked the NAACP leaders as being stodgy, 
and too dependent on white organizations. He opposed, opposed black Muslims because in his words, they advocate for the separation of the races. And he compared black power leaders to hate-filled Southern segregationists. His actions drew criticism. Robinson's defense of Rockefeller's proposed state office building in Harlem prompted younger African-Americans to brand him a quote unquote Oreo, um, meaning that he was black on the outside and white underneath. Um, this is a popular mass produced cookie in the United States. Um, meanwhile, Nixon's campaigning for Goldwater in 1964 and his courtship of segregationist Senator Strom Thurmond of South Carolina in 1968 signaled on the part of Nixon a shift to the right that alienated Robinson. So Robinson in 1968 skipped the Republican convention that both nominated Nixon over Rockefeller and ratified Nixon's choice for vice president, Governor Spiro T. Agnew of, of Maryland, who had a little bit earlier upbraided a group of African-American leaders following racial unrest in Baltimore. Robinson ridiculed the gaff prone Agnew as a quote unquote, nice, stupid guy. And he later told an interviewer that Nixon had prostituted himself to the racist Thurman in order to get the Southern vote. Robinson thus endorsed Democratic nominee Hubert Humphrey at an event in Harlem. And he even threatened to register as a Democrat if Nixon gets in. Ultimately though, Nixon went on to defeat Humphrey. The 1968 election proved to be the last in which Robinson participated. He was suffering from declining health as well as, as a sense that he was no longer a leading voice in the civil rights movement or the GOP. He warned that the incoming Nixon administration has not given black America any hope and that racial harmony was a long way off. He panned the organizational chaos and snafus of Nixon's initiative to bolster minority owned businesses. And he bemoaned the very poor relations between black America and the present administration, and that's another quote. In his autobiography published in the early 70s, he lamented sticking by Nixon in 1960. But the president's effort to boost black entrepreneurship, a cause dear to Robinson suggested room for reconciliation. And notwithstanding his appeals to white Southerners, Nixon amassed a record that included extension and expansion of the Voting Rights Act, desegregation of Southern schools, and a strong program of affirmative action. Robinson wrote in 1969, quote, I believe Nixon does have sincerity in many areas, but I believe his commitments are such that he has to be cautious. And again, that would be a reference to Nixon's courtship of white Southerners. The president responded to letters to Robinson here in this period, kind of sad, um, with form letters and um, with general public statements praising John Robinson and his career. But um, I find this interesting. Robinson in 1972 paid a visit to a campaign fundraiser hosted by Nixon's African-American supporters. But by that year, again, 1972, diabetes, high blood pressure and heart trouble had taken their toll on him. And his biographer, Arnold Rampersand observed, Jack, quote, was no longer even a small force in national politics and he took no part in either party's primaries that year. Following Robinson's death late in 1972, Nixon released a statement that hailed Robinson's brilliance on the playing field, which had paved the way for an America, and these are President Nixon's words, where black and white people work side by side. Quote. Having invested so much in their relationship, Nixon and Robinson parted regretfully and somewhat reluctantly. Joe Lewis once admitted, Sometimes I, this is a quote from Joe Lewis, sometimes I wish I had the fire of a Jackie Robinson to speak out and tell our story. That reflection underscored Robinson's contribution to both civil rights and national politics, though he bequeathed something of a mixed record. As Roger Kahn has asserted, quote, Robinson's political career, unlike his baseball life, trails off into disappointments and conditional sentences. End quote. Regarding his presidential preferences, Robinson went three for eight. Eisenhower won in 1956. Nixon took the GOP nomination in 1960 and LBJ prevailed in 1964. On the other hand, Humphrey failed to get the Democratic nomination in 1960 
He failed to win the White House in 1968. Um, Nixon lost, of course, to Kennedy. And Humphrey was denied the Democratic nomination in 1960, and he lost in 68 to Nixon. So uh, a 375 average is stellar for a baseball batter, but less so for a political operative, a position for which the Baltimore Afro-American noted in that editorial I showed you a little earlier, Robinson lacked training. The larger story though was of a figure defined by courage, passion, breakthroughs, and an unconquerable spirit. In politics, Robinson avoided easy roads, never became an unbending partisan or accolade of front runners, and remained, however, quixotically a liberal Republican devoted to free enterprise and racial equality. The decline of the GOP's Rockefeller wing coincided with other regressions, less in support for racial integration, criticism of big state liberalism, and Robinson's own failing health and waning influence. Robinson's activism, however, set it an example for other African-American athletes. In the election of 1968, Elgin Baylor of the Los Angeles Lakers, who you see here, number 22 at the top left, um, Elgin Baylor endorsed Humphrey, while his teammate, Wilt Chamberlain, supported Nixon. And right next to him, you see Wilt Chamberlain there with number 13. Four years later, National Football League greats Gail Sayers, number 40, and Jim Brown, number 32, lined up behind Nixon. Decades later, National Basketball Association stars LeBron James and J.R. Smith campaigned for Hillary Clinton in 2016. And there at the bottom uh, right in yellow, number 23 is LeBron James. And uh, Steph Curry right next to him of the Golden State Warriors in 2020, broadcast um, an endorsement of Joe Biden at the Democratic Convention. In 2020, Major League Baseball and basketball players staged walkouts in solidarity with Black Lives protesters. And of course, Colin Kaepernick, you see number seven kneeling there, began this practice of, uh, of kneeling during the national anthem to protest injustices against African-Americans. And of course, he has been um, excluded from playing uh, no team will pick him up, and, um, and he is kind of leading an unfortunate forced retirement. The extent to which Robinson inspired each of these sportsmen and women is hard to ascertain, but at the very least, the former Brooklyn Dodger normalized the blending of sports and political advocacy, which has become commonplace by the 21st century. The continued involvement of U.S. athletes in politics, civil rights, and the politics of civil rights owes a great deal to the life and legacy of Jackie Robinson. His footprints in American popular culture are pretty, pretty dramatic and important. I'm a stamp collector and I can't think of another African-American historical figure who's appeared on three different US postage stamps. And I also can't think of another baseball player who has. And that middle stamp there, that this was the celebrating the century um, a series of stamps for each decade at the end of the 20th century. That's really an iconic picture of Robinson sliding and stealing a base. And it inspired a later image of another, and I guess you'd have to say a larger breakthrough to be sure of Obama's election um, in 19, uh, uh, in, in 2008. Let me bring it back to Joe Biden. You know, um, it won't happen this year, but last year the Dodgers won the World Series. And when they did, Biden brought them to the White House. And I have to say it was much nicer than anything when when Trump, when there was always this, 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 you know, this, this, this air and this atmosphere of of tension and negativity. Um Biden said, you know, the the Dodgers, they're they're many things there to, to American popular culture. It's the voice of Vin Scully. And it's the uh, famous broadcaster. And of course, it's the, uh, the example of Jackie Robinson. Thank you very much. Be happy to answer any questions if you'd like.